Hey! All right. <laughs> Welcome to the PowerShell Virtual User Group. Uh, I'm Joel Bennett, and uh, my 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 speaker is like my guest speaker is like right behind that desktop. You can't see her, um, but June will be here, and she's going to present on classes. And uh, I am going to let her take it away. Cool. Okay, and Joel, what I need you to do is let me know. Yeah, yeah. can you see me? Yeah, yeah I can let, see myself. Yeah, but let me know if for any reason that screen freezes like it did during. Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, cool, cool. So, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, classes in the Windows PowerShell 5.0 preview. Um, I'm using the February update to that preview, which is 5.0.10018.0. And when you realize that you know the build number, right, you know you're dealing with a preview. So a lot of this can change. Um, so um, just uh, realize that, that we're dealing with a preview and uh, everything is kind of tentative. So um, if you don't know me, I'm June Blender. Um, I worked on the PowerShell team from 2006 to 2012. That's PowerShell 1 through PowerShell 3. And I wrote the help that you see when you type get help for core. So now I am off at Sapien Technologies as a technical evangelist working on PowerShell and uh, having a really good time. I'll take some questions also. Um, you feel free if you have a question, Joel. You can interrupt me and let me know if somebody has a question, wants to talk about something. Yeah, but we're going to talk. Um, yeah, go I on. I wanted to mention something before we go further, which I should have mentioned in my intro, which is that we do record these. These are all on my um, stream on YouTube. Uh, all the previous, well, most of the previous ones, and this one will be. Um, they get recorded automatically. And uh, put there. So the 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 username you want to look for is Posh Code. Cool. Yeah, and feel free to you know interrupt and ask questions. Um, classes are a developer topic in general, and so what I'm doing is trying to explain classes to everyone. So this is for beginners all the way up. So feel free to jump in with a question if I've said something terribly confusing. So let's start with what is a class, okay? So in Windows PowerShell, a class defines a type of object. It's not an object itself. Instead, it's a specification of an object, like this model of a house. You can't live in it. It's just a model. It's just a specification. It might say, well, you know, we're going to have walls and a roof and doors and some windows and a bedroom or two, right? But it, you can't really live in it. Instead, you create objects based on that specification. And you're used to dealing with classes. So the class that get process returns is are instances of the process class, the system.diagnostics.process class. And to discover um, uh, information about that class, you use the get member command split. And in the same way, you'll be able to use getMember to discover the properties and methods and other members, like events, of the classes that you create in Windows PowerShell. And I'm calling these scripted classes. I don't know if they have a, a different name for them. But they have a similar status to the .NET classes that you'll find in the .NET library. And there are some exceptions, um, like you can't create them at the command line. And we'll talk about those as we go through. So tonight, we're going to create a wine class and a wine glass class. I'll try to enunciate really clearly. And we'll be able to see those in GetMember the same way that we see the process class and other .NET classes. And we'll be, take, we'll be looking at instances of a class. So the class was the model like a model of a house. And an instance is an actual object that's based on that class. So it's a house that's built from the model. And it has properties like roofs and doors that the class defines. But the properties of each instance of that class might differ. 
So for instance, um, if you have processes based on the process class, those processes have different names and they have different values for handles and working set. And in the same way, we're going to create a wine class and each of our wines will have different properties. And to discover information about instances, instead of using get member, we typically use format list dash property all. So the good old FL asterisk. And just like we do it for the PowerShell process, we also can do it for a wine, um, a wine an instance of a wine, like this lovely PS wine from Chateau Schnover, or a wine glass, like this glass here that has about uh, eight, about uh, six ounces left for my eight ounce pour. Okay. So again, we'll be doing a wine class and a wine glass class. Now, why are we even going to all of this trouble? Um, you know, are, are these just, you know, fun things to create, to do a talk on, or are they really useful? Are they really practical? They were designed to create DSC resources, right? But what the way I see them is that they're really just one step beyond custom objects, like PS custom object. You create, you can create custom objects all the different ways, hash tables, CSV files, select object returns custom objects, but what if you could create real classes with reusable, a, a reusable object model with methods and events and be able to script with your own classes just the way you do with .NET classes? So I see classes as, as really the final frontier on the DevOps continuum. We started with running commandlets and then running scripts. And soon you got really good. You had your favorite commands, so you stuck them in a function. And you could write and run a function. You saved it in a file, and you could write and run a script. You eventually began to create modules. You saved your functions in modules, and you could share them with folks. And now we're moving to really the dev end of the DevOps continuum with classes. You can create a class and you can script with your own classes. But this isn't just for developers, this is for everyone. So my goal in giving this class about classes is kind of a, de a democratizing one to bring sort of classes to the masses. Um, but I want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable with um, classes in PowerShell 5 and cre can create their own. Okay, so I'm going to do a little demo of the wine class and I'm, I'm going to point out a few things. I'm going to show you my definition of the wine class. I'm going to create an instance and I'm going to show you how to use the properties and methods of the wine class. Now one thing that you'll notice is that I'm going to be working in ISE because you can't create types at the command line. Um, and this is the reason that it said in the help topic was that's because you can't use a type literal outside the script module or file in which the class is defined. So um, that's the technical reason, but it doesn't work. You have to create the class and you have to create all instances of the class in a script or module. You can't create those at the command line. Once you have them and you run your script or module and they're in the session, you can play with the instance of a class, but you can't um, manipulate the class at the command line. Um, and also, new object doesn't work when you're creating instances of the class because you can't refer to the type name as a string. And again, these come from the, um, the preliminary help topics in um, PowerShell 5 February release. So, I'm going to pop out of this um, and log in again. Okay. Okay. So, Joel, could you verify that you can see that you can see my VM and Yes, you might want to make it a little bigger, but I A little could. bigger? Yeah, I could do that. Not a They're problem. all lagged by like a couple minutes, so they'll all complain about the font size in like a minute and a half. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. You know, um, 
that kind of age. So, oh, look at that. Yes, I can watch what's happening. I'll wait for this to resolve. No one should copy my password. Okay. And now you'll see me increase the font size. So people are seeing what I'm seeing in the chat. Is that right? OK. And that's going to get bigger. And let me know if you need it even bigger than that. So um, basically what I have here, I'm going to scroll all the way up to the top and open this up. I have my wine class in here. Um, it begins with help topic. Right? We'll talk about help for classes. And I'm going to skimush that. Um, so here's where I'm defining my class. I have some properties and methods. And we'll talk all about this as we go through um, the talk tonight. I'm creating some wines here using different um, methods. And we'll talk about that. And I've also taken my wines, exported them to a CSV file, and imported them back in. And I've done the same thing, exported them to an XML file and imported them back in. So I will talk about all of that. But first, I want to show you what you get when you do that. So let's look at one of our wines. We have a PS wine here. Ah, I have to run it. Sorry. There we go. And now I'll have, whoops. Now I'll have my PS wine here. There we go. Ah, and we have a lovely wine. I'm using fictitious wines so that um, we don't anger any real winemakers. And I'm going to wait for the screen to catch up. Ah, it's doing all the wrong things. OK. I want you to see this, so let's wait. No, I have wait. to wait for that. They're, they're, they will get it. They're just, it's just because it's going through YouTube, they're delayed. OK, all right, that's fine. I'll keep going then. So what we have is, um, is a wine object. And you see that we have the name and the winery and the year. These are properties. So let's take the PS wine object and send it to get member. And you can see that we have a couple of methods. These are methods that all .NET classes have. And we have a bunch of properties. I added these to be um, um, consistent with what I've learned about wines on my recent trip to Napa. So a color and a description. I have a Boolean about it being sparkling, the name and the price and the sweetness and the winery and the year. And let's bring, let's bring um, our PS wine back up here. And you can look at that. And I've got, um, let's look at the other wines here. I have a local wine um, from our fictitious Escalante winery. And this is a, um, this is a sweet white sparkling wine um, for a very reasonable price. And From Sapien, we have a really nice, dr very dry red wine um, that's, that was bottled in 1990. This is fantastic wine, again, for a reasonable price. And we can play with our wines. So I'm going to look at my XML wines. That's all of them. And I can do things with my wines just like I can do um, with um, anything I can um, format them in a table with the name and the year and the price. Let's use auto size. Okay. Um, I can sort them by price. That's always a good thing to do. Whoops. And I can sort them by price and show the name, the year, and the price. There we go. So you could see that. Um, I can, let's see, I can group them by color. I can group them by is sparkling. Okay. And uh, I'm going to show you one more thing because I think it's pretty cool. Um, in my CSV wines, when I send this to get member, 
Oops. I'm, I'm used to just typing GM here. I'm trying to be on my best behavior. What you'll notice is that I have a real wine object. I don't have a CSV prefixed wine object, and that's because I put a special constructor in there, and I'll talk about that. So these are the kinds of things. So basically what you're seeing is that my wine class and the instances of the wine class work about the way you deal with .NET classes um, that are part of the .NET library rather than ones that I just created in a script. So let's come back here to the slides and let's talk about how to do this. And at this point, I really welcome you to open up your laptop and create a class with me. Um, this is really easy to do. Um, it's, we're really going to go sort of line by line. And we'll begin by using the class keyword. So the syntax is the class keyword and a class name and then the, a script block with the, um, the properties and methods of the class. And here's an example. Here's the keyword class. And here's my wine class and my script block. And while this class isn't particularly useful, it is sufficient. So let's, let's take a peek at this. I'm going to go over here. OK. And I am going to, I'm in a different PowerShell tab here. And I am going to create this wine class, OK? And there's nothing in it, right? So I'm going to create an instance of this wine class. I'm going to call it my wine. And I'll tell, show you how to create an instance. What I'm going to do is I'm going to call the static method of all classes, the new static method, sorry. The name of the method is new. And when I call a static method on a class, I put the class name, the type name, in, in um, square brackets. I have two um, consecutive colons with no space in between. I have the word new. And then inside of these parentheses, I can put parameters. But in this case, I don't need any. So I'm going to run this. Okay. And now I have my wine. Okay. And I'm going to send it to get member. And you'll see that it has some of these basic methods. I didn't create these. I get these from system.object. Um, all objects have these. But I actually did create a class that I can fool around with. I can take my wine and send it to format list dash property all. And it doesn't show me anything. I don't have any properties. But I have created a type. And I can even say, I can even ask, is my wine a wine? Let's see if it'll let me do this at the command line. No, it won't, but I can do that in here. Let's do this here. My wine is a wine. And when you I know that this, you can do that at the command line if you wrap everything inside a script block. If I wrap... You have to define the wine and use the wine inside of the same script block. So if you put, like, dot open... Oh, code I break, gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's well, let's the only way that. you can do it at the command line. Yeah, let's let's leave this for now because this will work. Yeah, I just want to make sure that people know it is possible. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. And actually, if you want to, after we're done, you can show that. Okay. So let's see what what do we have? Um, so yeah, so we've created a class with nothing in it, but that was sufficient. Okay. So then, when we add properties, I'm going to show you the syntax for adding properties. Again, here's class and class name and our script block. And the syntax for a property looks a lot like when you define a variable um, in, in PowerShell outside of a class. So you can use attributes like the validation attributes. Um, it's optional. I'm using these square brackets here to indicate that it's optional. Um, you can specify the type. And um, again, that's optional, but it's a good idea in classes, and you'll see why. The property name is required, and you can define a default value. And if you do, um, 
a space is required between the property name and that equal sign that indicates the default value. Um, that might be a bug in the current version of PowerShell, but I didn't want to get, I wouldn't want people to get stuck on it. So here's an example. Um, I've created, here's my class, and I've created a property called name, and it's a string. I didn't use any attributes, and I didn't set a default value. But that's really enough to create a property in the class. I can create more um, complex properties. In addition to name, I've done color, and I've used um, the validate set attribute that lets me set um, a fixed set of values for the attribute. So the only thing that color can be is red, white, or rosé. And I'm sure there are some wine aficionados who would disagree with that, but um, I'm trying to show validate set and not wine. Um, uh, the year is an integer, and the default value is um, get date dot year, so it's the current year. And again, you need that space. I'm not sure if you need that always. And um, here are my actual wine class properties, and you can see how they're defined. There's the name in the winery. Those are strings. The year is an integer. is sparkling as a Boolean. Here's that color with a validate set. I have um, a sweetness property. Um, here I'm using an enumerated type. I'll talk about those in just a little bit. Um, and um, the description is a string and the price is an integer. And so let's go look at those. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the little class that I created and I'm going to add a property to it. And so I'll make this a string and call it name, okay, because I'm so creative, okay. And now let's just run this, okay. And now my wine, good old wine, get member, now has a name property. And if you notice over here, Windows PowerShell automatically added a getter and a setter for me. So what that means is that I can get the value of the wine property and I can set it. Oh, sorry, the name, uh, the value of the name property of the wine and set it. So let's let's do this. Let's look at my wine and set its name to. Uh, we will use great duck. Okay. So I can set that property value and I can get it. Okay. And if you want to look at those sort of free getters and setters, you use dash force on get member. And you can see that what it's added when I add that name property and you can see the name property down here, is that it's added a get underscore name method that takes a string, or sorry, that, um, yeah, that returns a string and takes no parameters, and a set name method that takes a string and returns no uh, value, that takes a string parameter and returns no value. And so I didn't need to define those. In most languages, uh, you would need to define the getter and setter properties for every, or the getter and setter methods for every property, but you don't need to here. Okay, and we can take a look in my wine class. Let's go up here. Here are the properties. And when I take any of my wines, let's grab the duck, okay, and send it to get member dash force, okay. That in addition to the properties, I have get and set methods for all of the properties that I created. And I got those for free. All I did was create the properties. So, any questions? Are we we okay there, everybody? Yeah, no questions so far. I think everybody's just going, oh, wow. Yeah, it's pretty fun, isn't it?
Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I think it would be really appropriate if you um, got a glass of wine or whatever it is that you like to drink, be it water or tea or, you know, Diet Coke and, you know, sit back and enjoy and create a class of your own. It doesn't need to be a drink. You can do a dog class or a kitten class or even something really useful like a DSC resource. So now we're going to talk about adding methods and I always like to start with a syntax. Okay, I'm very deductive so I'm going to take you through this. Um, the required part of a method is the method name followed by parentheses in which you can optionally include parameters. And even if you don't have parameters in your method, you still need those parentheses. Now, we're really familiar with methods because we call them all the time. So when, you, when you're messing with a process class, right, you, use, you might use the kill method to get rid of your process or, or use a start method. Um, you might call a two-string method um, directly in addition to using commandlets. And um, these methods will make our class um, do things. Sorry, let's get back. So we have the method name. We have any parameters that the method requires in parentheses. Okay. Um, the parentheses are required even when there's no parameters. Then we have a script block. Um, and we can do whatever we need to in the script block to um, run the method. And then there's an optional return type. We'll talk about that in just a second. And um, this defines the type that the method returns. So an integer, a string, a process, even a wine. Um, unlike output types in Windows PowerShell advanced functions, return types are really a contract. So if you have a return type on your method, you must have a return statement in your uh, in your method that returns the type of object that you promise to return in this return type. So if you have this return type and no return statement, you have a syntax error. If you return something and have no return type, then you have a syntax error. And what I'm seeing in um, this, this February version of the preview is that if the return type and, the ret and what you're actually returning don't match. So for instance, if you're returning, if, you, if the return type is integer and you're returning a string, then you're going to runtime error as soon as you call that method. Okay? So let's see, what else can I tell you? Oh, um, this first parentheses, this opening parentheses, must be on the same line as the method name. If you, you know, do one of these and, um, you know, want to use a different format, that won't work. You're going to get a syntax error. Okay. So uh, here are all my rules. So you can go through them. The parentheses around parameters are required even when there are no parameters. Ah, here's a good one. All parameters are mandatory and positional. Um, and so what that means is that you can have multiple methods with the same name and different combinations of parameters and parameter types. Um, that's called an overload. And the way you deal, the way you create a sort of optional parameter, and I'll demonstrate this in just a minute, is to create two versions of the same method with the same name, and one has the parameter and one does not, right? And that makes it optional. But you can have multiple methods with the same name just so they have different parameter types and numbers. This default return type is void, which means it doesn't return anything. And if you then return something, you'll, you have an error. Um, all paths in your method, so all logical paths, if you have an if, have to return the same return type. Um, and the return keyword is required. So um, in a function, if I just type uh, a variable name and run the, and run my function, it writes the variable value to standard output, but it does not do that in classes. You must use the return keyword in order to return something. And again, that first parentheses must be on the first line, and that might be um, just specific to this release. 
Um, the return type is a contract. We talked about this. And the return keyword is required. And let's see what else. Ah, this. So this in classes, dollar this, actually works like a scope modifier. It refers to the current instance of the class. So in that way, it's very much like dollar underscore in functions, but for classes. It's the dollar underscore of classes. Okay? But it distinguishes properties of the class, the names of properties of the class, from parameters and variables that you might use in the class. So here's an example that I have. This is a class called tree, um, and it has a tree species and a height. Okay, and here I have a, a, a method, um, this is a special kind of method, we'll talk about these in a few minutes, but this also has species and height parameters, okay, but inside I'm talking about this dot species, so this is my scope modifier, when I use this, I'm referring to this, so I'm referring to dollar species by typing dollar this dot species. Okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm taking this value, this species parameter value, and assigning it to the this dot species property. Okay? And then this dot height, meaning the height of the current instance of the tree, refers to this. And I'm using and what I'm assigning to it is this parameter value. So I'm taking the parameter value and I'm putting it in the property value by using this. And you'll see this all over. But you can just think of it as the dollar underscore for classes. So let's take a look at methods. Here's the wine class method, but I'm going to show it to you for real. So let's go back to here. Hey, can I interrupt you for a question? Yeah, you bet. Um, do you have the source code that you're demoing here available? Yeah, I somewhere? do. Yeah, I do, and I will um, share it with everyone afterward. I figured that was the answer. Thanks. Yeah, is that okay? Yep, perfect. Yeah, good, okay. So here's my um, wine class, and here are the properties. And I'm going to scroll down, and the method that I have in my wine class is a, is a two string method. Okay? And I'm going to take, I'm unhappy with the two string method that I get from system.object. So I'm going to create a string and I'm just going to take this dot color, meaning the color of each wine, and I'm going to um, load the color into this color variable. And if it's sparkling, I'm going to prepend that to color. And then I'm going to return this nice string. And so let's use that and let's see what it looks like. So I'll use I'll grab my duck and I'll say two string. So it takes let's look again because I wanna take a peek at this. Um, this one has no parameters. I'm still using those required parentheses. If I bring them down off of that first line, I get a syntax error. Okay. Um, the string, here is my return type. This matches the return keyword, which is required, and this value is a string, so they match. Um, so it should work. Let's see. So let's look at the duck. Ah, a sparkling white wine. And this is much nicer than just seeing you know, the name of an object. And I can grab my XML wines or my CSV wines and say for each, call the two string method. And um, ISE is not showing the right stuff here, so ignore that. Okay. And I've just used for each to create a, a nice um, string for each of my wines. And you can see the price and the sweetness and we'll come back to these. Okay. Does that get called if you just like cast that or put it in a string? Um, let's try it. So 
Let's do the XML lines. Oh, let's just use duck. Use this. I was going to say use this. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Well, no, it's, this is just as easy. So let's just use this. And so do like out string. Or, well, oh. just put, put that in quotes. Just put quotes around got duck. It. Okay, got it. Yeah, sure. No, it doesn't. Uh, but let's let's see, yeah, let's see if it works um, for out string. Whoops. Have to be able to type when you're nervous required for this job. It does. So out string will call it. Okay. Any other questions? No, that That's didn't pretty cool. call it. That used the properties. Oh, you're right. It did not call the string. Thank you. Yeah. It shouldn't. Do, I mean, it should do what it did, but... Yeah, there we go. Okay. So, let's go back here. Oh, I know what I wanted to do. I wanted to add a method here. So, let's drag this back down. So, what we have here is our really basic class that um, only has the, the name property. And what I've done here is I've added an amount property and a very simple method that takes a drink. And at this point, we don't have a glass, so we're sort of taking a drink from the bottle, which really isn't polite. But um, we have this method called drink. It's very simple. It takes an integer called ounces. You can tell that this is not internationalized yet. And it just says that if there's enough in the bottle, subtract the specified number of ounces from the this.amount, that's the, the instance property, and return the result. So after you, um, after you take the drink, tell me what I have left. And let's run this. I'm going to pull this up so you can see it. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a wine with a name and an amount. And here I am. So now I have my wine. And I'm just going to let you see that it has a name and an amount. Any trouble seeing this? You guys can see this? OK. And now I can say mywine.drink. And I'm going to drink two ounces, just kind of a gulp. And I have six left. So I can see that here. Where's my wine? There we go. I have six left. And that's how the method works. So let's take a peek and look at this in get member. I'll take my wine, get member, and you could see the drink method. And now that you know how methods are, um, are used in classes, it makes more sense. The dot, all of a sudden, the .NET method signatures make more sense to us. It starts with the return type, then the method name. And here are the parameters. We have an integer, and the parameter name is ounces. Okay. So how do we call these methods? Okay. Now, when you call a method, unlike using a function, right, you don't use any parameter names. All of the methods are all of the parameter values actually are mandatory and positional, and again those parentheses are required even when you're not um, specifying any parameters. Okay, so I have a little um, method here called SIP. Um, it takes an integer of ounces, you know, how much did I drink, and a, a string response. Okay, and I wanted to use um, parameters of two different types. So one is an integer and one is a string, and I've specified them in that order. Okay. So the way I would call this method is that I type my wine dot sip, the name of the method, and in parentheses goes the number of ounces and that response string. Here we have what a delightful finish, which is one of those things that people who drink wine say. Um, and this will work. This is valid. If I were to reverse the order of the parameter values, right, if I put the string before the integer, that would fail. If I omitted one of them, in this case, I omit the string, 
and just put in the integer, that fails. And in this case, I try to type the parameter names, and that fails too. So the correct way to do this is to, um, is to um, look carefully at this, this signature, this um, parameter list, and make sure that you um, provide your parameter values in the right order. And they're comma separated. So we've created, we've, um, we've looked at methods, we've called the method, let's see, we've called this method here, we've done that already, and now we want to create an instance of the wine. Um, now I've done this a few times, but I've sort of skimmed over what I'm actually doing. So to create an instance of a class, you use the new static method of classes, there are several other ways to do this. Um, this is a nice, simple way to do this. The parameters of the new method match a constructor, and we're going to talk about constructors in just a minute. New object doesn't work because you can't refer to the type name as a string, and so, and again, um, you can't create types at the command line, although Joel might have a workaround for that. Um, so let's look at constructors. Constructors are special methods for creating an instance of an object. Um, the constructor name is always the class name. You can have multiple constructors for a class, but each one has to, has to have a different signature, a different number or type of parameter values. Um, and uh, Windows PowerShell adds that null constructor, a constructor with no parameters to every class, which is why without defining a constructor, uh, I, got, I was able to create instances of that class. Once I create a, an explicit constructor, the null constructor that Windows PowerShell adds is no longer effective. And if I want a parameterless constructor, I have to create one myself. So here's what these guys look like. This is a parameterless constructor. There's just no parameters in there. This is automatic in Windows PowerShell. So that's why I was able to create instances of my wine class without it. Um, this constructor, remember, it has to have the same name. This one takes a string for the name of the wine, and it um, inside the constructor inside the constructor method, it takes whatever name you give it and it assigns it to the proper the name property of the object, of the wine object. This one takes a name and a price. I've used validate range on the price to, so that you can see that I can use um, validation attributes and um, it assigns the name and the price to their respective um, properties. So let, let's look at this and um, use it for real. Okay. So in this really simple class, okay, in this really simple class, I'm going to stick it in here, and I'm going to create a constructor. So oops, it always has to have the name of the class, which is wine, and here is one of those parameter lists or null constructors. And I can also have a constructor that takes a string for the name. Oops. This is in the wrong spot. There we go. It takes a string for the name. And here I will do this.name, which is the property of the instance, and assign the name to it. Okay. And if I want to, I can also add the amount here. Let's do that. I'm going to create another one of these constructors. This is just special method. So the rules for methods apply to these constructors as well. And the only difference is that each one has to have the same name as the class. So let's do name and an integer for the amount. Okay. And we'll do this dot amount equals the amount here. 
oops, I don't want to save that. This is just my working copy. Okay. And now rather than doing this, I'm still using that same static method and I can get rid of this. Whoops. Okay. And let's run that. And now my wine has a name and an amount right from the get-go. Okay? And I'll show you something else that's super cool. Because I have this parameter list constructor, I can also use a hash table, the kind that was included in Windows PowerShell, to do custom objects. So I can actually define, I'll just do another wine, we'll call it a wine because I'm really creative. And let's do that wine type. And I can create one. And here the names and the property names have to match. So I can do um, um, uh, PS Cabernet and six ounces of that. And that needs to be amount equal six. And there we go. Okay. So what I've done is I've created um, a hash table and um, used that to create a, an instance of my wine object. And then when I run this, let's run it here so that you can see it rather than doing F5. Um, now I have both my wine and a wine. Okay. And as you can see, let's a wine and my wine. Get member. They are both wine objects. Okay. This is lots of new stuff. Is anybody just completely confused? Are we okay? Any any questions in there, Joel? Yes, actually. Sure. Um, a couple. I was actually trying to figure out the answer to one of them. Maybe you know. Um, oh, hang on one sec. Okay, so the first the first thing is um, I found um, the problem with the two string. Because I was sure that that demo I asked you to do would work, um, and it didn't. And oh, that's the wrong me. Hang on. Here. Um, so there is a little, a quick little demo. Um, what happened with your two string is that it's apparently case sensitive. Ah. So if you don't have a capital T, then they won't call it by default. Oh my gosh, that's a great, whoa. That's one of the very few times in Windows PowerShell that it's case sensitive. Thanks. That is, yeah. Well, that worries me a little because, um, you know, it, it speaks of other problems which we may have. Well, it's still a preview. Um, but well, I think in this case it's going to. It, I guess what I'm not sure of is what on earth, how on earth they managed that. But um, obviously .NET is case sensitive underneath, and so lowercase to string and uppercase to string are not the same. And when you're converting to string, it really, really matters. So. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Well, well do, do you want me? To, we should test that. I'm gonna. I'll change the the T to a capital T. Yep. Yeah, and um, let's let's run this. Let's see. Whoops. Yes, I do want to save it. And now let's see if that works. So let's do that. Duck. You need to rerun it. Um, I did. Oh yeah, you did. Yeah, so that so works. Now try with quotes around duck instead right, of. Right, right, right. Let's try this. 
Now you notice, by the way, the funny thing about it is invoking to string isn't. It does work. Look at that. Yeah. Whoa. It's, yeah, it's, I'm, it's I'm, just weird because in PowerShell, like what your line calling dot to string, that's not case sensitive, but the actual right. implicit call is. Well, that's good to know, and that's something that we can tell folks so that they don't get messed up. Yeah. Now then, the yeah, other the, question, um, Kirk asked, can you make pre can you make parameters optional by assigning default values? No, and I'll show that. Oh, that's a great question. Hi, Kirk. You get together with PowerShell people. It's it's like a family <laughs> thing, you know. Um, great. So I'm going to show you if I try to do something like that. I'm going to use this simple version of the wine class, but I'll 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 make this amount, and I'll say that the default is six. Okay. Got it. And then down here, when I create this guy and this one. I will omit the amount. Or actually, what I'm, gonna, yeah, what, what I'm going to do, yeah, I'm going to take this guy out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, how he be, I don't know how he behaves, right? So I'm going to run this again. Let me pull up the curtains here so you can see what's happening. So what I did, and, and let me show you this. This is, um, um, okay, well, let's do this. And... Boy, I thought I was going to get an error. Let's 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 see what happens. Well, you have with... another con another constructor, right? Yeah, but just take a string. But what's the amount? Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, it's it's going to use this constructor if it doesn't have that one, and then I have these. But let's see, is there a way to demonstrate? Just this comment out that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And is that the end of it, boy? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Whoops. Don't want to save that. And let's run it. Right. And there we go. So we can't find an overload for new with argument count one. And but that's really the reason the alternative to these to optional parameters. And this is you know, the optional parameters is a PowerShell thing, and .NET doesn't have them. But the okay, alternative... Now, that's why he's asking that question. Because C Sharp got that syntax, that exact syntax that you have there, basically. Right, with a they with the assignment. They added ability to assign a default value recently so that you don't have to write the same code twice. Ah, got it. I didn't know that. And so that's, that's why he, I'm sure that's why he's asking the question. It's kind yeah, of Yeah, thanks, Kirk. Thanks for that question. I don't see it working here. Yeah. Or I don't see it working in what's the way that... I'm I was going to say, what's weird is that it lets you assign it. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's not a syntax error. There are a whole bunch of those, those kind of just weirdnesses that's, here. Maybe maybe it's maybe that's for future because it should complain about the equal six in the right right. But I, if I do something, so I'm I'm up here in my um, property section, yeah, and I can say amount equals six. Right. Watch this. If I delete that space, oh. all of a sudden it tells me <laughs> that I'm missing. Right. So some yeah. Uh, that's weird. It, it's a preview. It's it's yeah, yeah. really. It's a preview, and, and we all love it uh, because it's way better than nothing at all. So thank yeah. you for letting me know that, that, um, that in order to override that method, I needed to make that case sensitive. Very good. I have another one from Kirk, yeah. um, which I don't know the answer to at all. Can you define implicit conversion operators for typecasting? I have no idea what that means. I, I was afraid you were going to say that. I'll play with it a little bit and see if yeah, I can. Yeah, and, and then also um, for for all the rest of us, please make sure that you explain I don't, what that is. I don't think well. So in in .dot net, um, there are operators, right? Like addition and subtraction. Yeah. Um, there the way that those work is that you define specially named methods to implement those operators. Now there's also special operators for typecasting. So when you cast a string to an int, um, well that's a bad example because PowerShell lets you do that but you can't do that in .NET 
directly. Anyway, but but the point is, you can define a special method which says when this type is being cast to this type, here's how to do it. And I don't think there's any syntax for operators in uh, the class language yet. Not uh, that I, not that I've seen. We were yeah, playing. It's yeah, it's not mentioned in either yeah. the release notes or in about classes. We were playing with ways of doing it, um, but I don't I don't think that it's it, put it this way. I think it would involve a hack. Um, I don't think it's supported currently. Yeah, well, we'll see. So it's not any, really a high value um, scenario for what we're looking at. Yeah. But if you figure it out, be sure to let us know because it's cool. And uh, there's there's another question here which um, I don't understand, but I'm going to ask it the way it was asked, and we'll see how far how we do. Yeah. Is Rob Rob asked, can you declare a default method? Oh, that's really what interesting. By that? Hey, Rob. <laughs> He said, I asked, can you explain it better? And so far, there's not any explanation. On yeah, but, but be sure that we that we handle this question. I, I don't know exactly what that means, but um, he let, let's make sure that we handle the question. So I, I'm going to go back here, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit. Let's see, we did um, calling a constructor. Um, by the way, if you... It, if you want to use that hash table trick, you absolutely have to have one parameter list constructor. Excuse me, just a second. <coughs> and that parameter list constructor has to be explicit. It can't be the one that PowerShell gives you for free. Okay. And there's my hash table trick. Okay, now the, here's where it gets fun. Now, let me just say that at this point, you have everything that you need to know to create classes, scripted classes in Windows PowerShell. Um, everything that I'm going to be doing from here on out is gravy. I mean, it's great gravy, and I hope that you use to understand it and use it and enjoy it. But really, creating a class, adding properties, adding methods, adding constructors, and then being able to get and set the properties and call the methods and use the constructors are, are really the fundamentals of classes. Um, I'm going to go back here just for a minute and um, peek at my wine class to let you see the real thing. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with this class, and I'm actually um, creating a little wine database based on these classes um, with the 12 bottles of wine that I brought back from Napa on my recent trip. Um, but what you can see up here is that I have help. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it, but you can't really create help for classes, but you can certainly create help for a script. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, best practices that I hereby establish for writing help for classes. Um, we haven't gotten to enums. That's one of our goodies. We'll get there. Here are the properties of the class, and we've gone through these. Um, now, I'm going to show you. I have some cool constructors here, and I'll show you what I did. I have um, one of these null parameter list constructors. I have a constructor that just takes the name of the wine. I have one that takes all of the properties and using this is kind of cool but it's a pain because when you have lots of properties you need to put those property values in exactly the right order. Um, if you switch the name in the winery no one is going to know until you run it and you have the wrong um, values for name and winery because all that the um, class implementer, the parser, is looking at is whether or not those are strings. Okay. Now I also have one that converts, it takes um, a PS object and it converts deserialized objects to regular, to um, standard wine objects. And that's why I'm able to, all the way down here, import that CSV file that has my wines in it and end up with a real wine. Um, class instead of a CSV uh, modified wine class. 
let's see, and here's that string method. And um, I now have this capitalized, right? And um, here, here's what I did to, to create the instances of the wine. Um, so first what I did is I used that simple constructor that only takes a name. So again, this is wine. Here's my type. Double colons, um, consecutively, no space. Um, the word new, that's the method name. And here's the constructor. Oops, I did not mean to do that. The constructor value for the name. And then what I did was I went in and I assigned 1z, 2z, each one of the values to the properties, just to show that you could do this. Okay, I'm not sure that this is a practical way to do it, but it absolutely works. Um, here I used, in, um, for the PS wine, I used that complex constructor that takes every one of the properties in order. Um, and again, it's up to you to make sure that they really are in order. It's a little tricky to do that. And for the duck, I used um, a hash table that relies on that null constructor. So let's go back here. And again, this is all available to everyone. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about interacting classes. And this is when it really gets to be fun. So I've created a wine class, but it's not polite to drink from the bottle. So I've also created a wine glass class. And one of the properties of my wine glass class is an instance of one of the wines. And because this is a glass and not a bottle, I have some in, I have entirely different um, properties and methods. So let's go look at my wine glass class. Okay. So what I have here, and I'm going to close the help, is my wine class. L let's open this. Sorry, I have my wine class, just the one that we talked about before. And now I have a new class. Again, I have these in the same script so that they're all available to each other. I have a wine glass class. And among its properties is an instance of the wine class. And here's my wine. Okay. Um, I have some extra variables. We'll talk about these in a few minutes. Here are my constructors. I have a null constructor, parameter list. I have um, a wine glass constructor. It takes an instance of the wine, and it tells a pour, which is how fancy people talk about um, adding wine to your glass. Okay, and um, in the constructor, I just assign, um, I assign the wine to the wine property. But here, what I'm doing is I'm actually calling a method in the class. I'm calling the pour method with whatever you give me um, in the wine pour. Okay. Now, if you'll notice, I actually have three properties, and my classes have maximum um, two parameters. And so I've given this one a default value. Most wine glasses are about eight ounces. So um, this has a getter and a setter, so you could always change it. But I didn't want people to have to keep setting the size of that wine glass. Okay. And those are the constructors. I have a method called sip which takes a number of ounces. And again, if there's enough in my glass, I can drink it, which changes the value of this dot amount, which is my instance property. And it also adds that number of ounces to consumed. And this is this little variable that I'm tracking up here. Now, one of the things to remember in classes, and we'll talk about this formally in just a minute, is that um, Windows PowerShell doesn't distinguish between properties and other variables. So any variables that you create in your class are properties of instances of that class. And um, we're going to do a little trick to make it less obvious, but you can't, as far as I know, you can't prevent it. So in my SIP method, I'm going to adjust the amount. I'm going to I'm going to subtract from the amount. I'm going to add to this consumed variable that I'm tracking in the instance. If it doesn't work, I'm going to say, you know, sorry, there's just not enough left to take that big a drink. And I'm going to return the, um, the new amount after the SIP, which is an integer, and here's my return type. 
And I also have a variation of this SIP method that doesn't take any parameters, okay? And it calls this SIP method with one, and it doesn't return anything, okay? So what that's doing is it's sort of a quiet SIP. I just call SIP, and it does it does its thing, but under the covers, it's still decrementing the amount and um, increasing consumed. And here's the pour method. This adds to the glass. So what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm saying, um, if if I add this to the amount, I might is the glass going to overflow? And if it isn't, I add it to the amount and I add it to total poured. And otherwise, I say, you know, oops. Let's not do that, bad idea. Um, I have a refill method, which just um, refills the, the glass to the amount that it can hold. And it also calls pour, this pour method up here, with the difference between the current size um, and the current amount. I've got a cute little method here that, that, that's using that consumed property. And it says that if consumed is greater than equal to 20, you're tipsy. Now, this varies with weight. I'm tipsy way less, at way less. Um, but what I'm showing here is using this consumed property. And also, I want to see um, how much I've spent. So I have a little get check method that returns a, a really nice string with sort of the bill and what what's going on here with the system math dot seal uh, the ceiling method of the system dot math class is that even if I drink one ounce of a second bottle so my bottle is here the standard bottle is 25 ounces or 750 milliliters that um, if I if I've um, drunk even 26 ounces I'm into two bottles and then um, I have a little get wine method, and I'll show you how I use that. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating my wines, and then I'm creating a glass of wine. Right? So let's bring this up. I'm going to run this. Cool. Yep. Always heave a big sigh of relief when the demo kind of works. right? So what I have here is, what did I call it? my glass. Okay, so let's look at my glass. And right now I have some wine in there. Let's take a peek at the wine in my glass. Ah, it's the PS wine. Okay, and uh, you can see, let's um, Auto size, you can see, and this is the reason it just says wine, and this is the reason I use that get glass or get wine, sorry, and it just grabs the wine for me. Okay, and so let's use some of the properties that we have here, and I'm just peeking here. I can change the wine, I can say my glass dot wine, okay, and I'm going to substitute um, the primal Syrah for the wine in the glass, and now my glass dot wine has a different wine, okay, and I can do things like my glass dot wine dot two string, and it tells me, it gives me that information about the wine in that nice um, formatted string. But I can do so. Let's see. Let's see how much I have in my glass. Okay, I have an eight-ounce glass with five ounces. So let's take a sip. Let's. Uh, and now I have three left. Okay, you can see that. And now, um, so let's. What are my choices here? Let's pour. So I'm gonna add. Let's see, I'll add, see if I can add five ounces. And my glass now has eight, which is its max. If I try to add another one, where's my pour? Type that. 
it says, no, nope, can't do that. It's going to overflow. So let's take a sip, and I'll use I'll do three, and I've got five left. And now I'll use the sip that doesn't take any parameters. This is my quiet sip. It should decrement by one. And it did. Okay. And I can ask, you know, am I tipsy yet? Oh, heck no, you're not even close. But I can check, get check. And it says I just, I'm just into that first wine with $36. So uh, you can see that I'm having a lot of fun here. Um, but what we have here are we have in two interacting classes. Um, we have a wine glass class. So my glass is an instance. Let's do get type. Whoops. Get type dot full name. Okay, it is a wine glass. Okay, and if we just do get type, you can see that it's based on system.object. We're going to use that information in just a little bit. And if I use my my glass dot wine dot get type, then I have a wine. Okay, also based on system.object. So what I have are two classes that are interacting with each other in really fun ways. Okay. I'm going to peek over for questions. Uh, nothing much. I have two. Um, one was, Don Hunt wants to know, is I, if a class constructor doesn't give a value to a property, does that property get null or... It yeah, it it does, or or it um, gets whatever the default was assigned. If if a default value was assigned, you can assign does a default get, value. You know, it, it gets the default value for the type, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. So if it, if it's an int, it's going to come out zero, not null. Right, right. Yeah. But you can also like if you notice in mine, I actually set that default value for the amount in the right. for the size of the glass, right? So in that case, yeah, that's what happens. Right. But it does, and it gets it gets the correct one for each type, it would not violate its own type. So we're used to PowerShell being sort of loosely typed, and these classes are, um, uh, I'm not, it, would you call it strongly typed, Joel, or is they, it? Is they are some... pretty strongly typed, because yeah. they're, be, in order to be a class and behave the way the CLR expects classes to behave, you know, you have a property, if it's, if you defined it as int size or int amount, then it's going to contain an int. It can't return null. Right. Because int can't be null in .NET. Right. And again, um, these aren't syntax errors. The um, type mismatch errors are runtime errors. So be sure that you test your classes really carefully if you're going to release them in a script or module. Okay. And then uh, Kirk asked, can you set breakpoints and class methods just like any other script block? You know, um, the release notes for the February preview said that you can debug classes, and um, I actually haven't tested that. Okay, so you're welcome to test it in, you know, while I'm talking and um, let folks know. All right. Fair enough? Okay. Fair enough. So, so now I'm going to talk about enumerated types. Um, Again, this is this is gravy. We're just having fun here. So I created a wine sweetness enumer a type enumeration, okay, and I put, added some values to it in the order that um, I would like them to be represented, okay. Now this is very much like using validate set, except that once I define it in my script, it is it it um. Or, um, or my module, um, it is, um, its scope is the entire script or module. So I can use it in my class. I can use it in functions. I can use it um, um, many different times. The other thing I can do, um, the, um, when you create an enumerated type, um, the base type of the enumeration values is an integer. So you can refer to these values by their names, which are assigned, 
or by their integer value and as you can guess it's a zero based value so in this case very dry is zero, dry is one, moderate is two, sweet is three and very sweet is four. So here are the rules right for rule based people like me. Um, the default values of enum types are zero based integers. You can change to a different integer but you can't change the base type Okay, so you can see up here, this is really small, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for you, that what I did, I created this basic color enum, and instead of having, um, using the default zero based integers, um, I've, I've just called them one, two, and three, and again, we have that issue with spaces when you're assigning values, okay? Um, the value, uh, that integer value of the enumerated type can be an expression. I've got seven petabytes and three more terabytes. That works just fine. Um, it can be a type of another um, um, enumerated, it can be an instance of another enumerated type, but it can't be an invoked command. This get date.year does not work. And um, the release note said that it must be a parse time constant. Okay, um, you can't define it or refer to it at the command line, but you can certainly refer to it in functions in your script. So in this case, outside of a class, I've created this basic color um, enumeration. I've created a favorite color enumeration. I'm using the blue from the basic color enumeration in my favorite color. And then when I create my get color function, I can use that favorite color um, enumerated type for the my fave parameter. And when I go to call that function, the enumerated types are available to me. Okay. So, um, so the two ways to do this, I'm going to talk about the syntax for just a minute, is, is one value on a line with no separator, right, just the new line separator, or on a single line with semicolon separators. And when you use the enum, you can use the integer or its name. And you can set alternate values. Uh, the values don't need to be sequential. They just need to be integers, and they can be expressions. So let me show you how I use this. Do, 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 do. Okay, I'm over here. Let's look at the wine. Yeah, let's look at this one. This is my wine glass. And here's the enumerator for wine sweetness. And I've assigned integers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 to these. And now the type of that sweetness pro property is wine sweetness. And when I create my instances all the way down here, here's the glass, and here's the wines, I can refer to the sweetness as one or dry. Uh, one is very dry, I think. Um, dry is two. Um, here I've used sweetness equals four. And so you can use those in either way. Let's get back up here so you can see this and see how it's used. So then when I use it in my property, I use wine sweetness just the way I would use the wine class. Okay, and let me let me show you something interesting here. Let's see if I can do this. So here's here's my glass and it's wine and sweetness and when I send this to get member it shows me a wine sweetness type. Okay. So that's enumerated types. The other thing, and we looked at this a little bit before, is that I get these free getter and setters each time I add a property. In another language, and I'm, I'm uh, um, familiar with Python and um, Java and Ruby. I don't know very many other languages, so I'll let other people jump in. But typically, when you add a property like this name string, if you don't add a, a set method for that property and you try to set it, you get an error that says something like it's a read-only property. 
and if you try to get it, um, then it says that it's private. You can't, you, you can't get at it. But Windows PowerShell adds those automatic getters and setters. And um, boy, I've messed up my wines and trees here. But um, but basically, I'm not even going to try to fix that now. I'll fix it later. But basically what happens here is that when you create a property in a scripted class, Windows PowerShell adds get and set methods for you. But what that also means is that all properties are public. You can get the value. And all properties are read-write. You can change the value. And all variables in the class are also properties of that class with getters and setters. So in order to ameliorate that somewhat, we have the hidden keyword. And hidden hides them from get member and other commandlets, like if you do format list, but you can see them in get member dash force. And what I've done here is hidden somewhat the consumed and total poured properties of that wine. So um, let, let's bring this up now and um, we'll talk about those. So what we have here, here are all of my properties and methods. Let's see if I've got it. Oh, it's part of the wine glass class. Here we go. And here we have these hidden properties that are really not very well hidden. And let me show you how these work. So I have, I'm going to get rid of that. I have my wine or my glass, sorry. I have my glass. And if I do format list dash property all, you see only wine size and amount. If you do get member and you look at the properties, you see wine size and amount. But I can do something like this. I can do, where's my glass, dot consumed. Now you see that ISE is not um, guessing that correctly, that IntelliSense is not working, and I can't um, auto-complete it. But I, I can get the value. And if I want to, I can set the value. And when I pipe my glass to get member dash force, I can see the consumed and total poured properties. And I can see that I have get consumed and set consumed, get total poured, and set total poured properties. So the way I refer to this as is as hidden sort of. Okay, let's talk about inheritance for a minute. This is a really powerful um, concept. So what inheritance does is it mm -hmm. sees... Oh, I'm sorry, sure. Sorry, sorry. I, I want to... Um, I have one thing I want to show, but I also wanted to answer sure. another question before you go into inheritance because you're deep now. Um, yes. <laughs> and if anybody's going to hang up... Then let's answer these two questions before. So Kirk's question about um, breakpoints, the answer is yes, they work fine. Um, Great. The Everything that I've tried works the way I expect it to. Um, I, I wanted to point out one other thing, though, which um, I'm guessing... Whoa, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just dragging things in the wrong windows. Don't mind me. Um... I wanted to point out one other thing because uh, I think at this point you're not coming to it. So um, just a little quick, um, if I can find ISE on my computer. Okay. And switch to me instead of you. There we go. Okay. So um, uh, hopefully this is big enough. But what I want to show is just the static keyword. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I took that out at the end, so thanks for doing that. I just, it's just a really, here's just the world's quickest example. And the only reason I put it in, I even thought of it, was because of your consume thing, that you were keeping track how much right. you had drunk on a glass. This method um, would prevent you 
So let's say that um, down here I've got my glass, right? I got a glass. I drank it. I poured a new one. I drank it. Um, when I ran out, this time I got a new glass because I wanted to switch wines. I don't know. Um, so let's say, in fact, let's even say that. Um, now what will happen is because... I've got this thing here, which is a static method uh, property called consumed. In order to reference it, I have to reference it with the PowerShell static way of referencing it, right? With the class name and colon colon. Um, and then I have a method down here, which is tipsy. This needs to be static, although actually it doesn't need to be static. It can be static. Either way, it's going to reference the static property, so it might as well be static in my yeah, yeah. Can, can I jump in here for a second, Joel? Yeah. For folks who are unfamiliar with a terminology, a static method is a method of the class and not any particular instance of the class. And that's what I'm trying to show right here. So Right, right. I just wanted is, to get the definition out there yeah. for people who might not be familiar with it. Yep, that's good. The idea here is that I can actually call like this. Doo -doo. Uh, um, so you see, I, I got a warning when I ran out of drink. It says, pour me a new refill. I drank some more. I checked in my tipsy, and I'm not. But I poured a new drink and took a couple of sips, and now I got a warning you're feeling tipsy. So even though I switched glasses and started sipping from a different glass, it kept track. Which oh, is that's great. Which was, yeah, so that's what would not happen in the example that you had because if I switch glasses, now the glass doesn't remember. So that's the reason why we use static properties is we want somewhere to stuff this thing that isn't going to go away when somebody switches objects. Yeah, that's awesome. So that was like a, a really cool way, a, a good example re, uh, to do it with. Anyway, um, I have one other question. Uh, no, there was not a, well, can I post a link to the Twitter, to your Twitter, because a couple of people are going to quit here, um, because it's getting late in Europe. Yeah, yeah, I apologize, I definitely could do that. So let me, um, just show, oh, you know, I don't have my own, yeah, I do. You so know, uh, um, I think let, that. Yeah, let, let me type it, let, let me type it in here, so it's, whoops. Hang on one second, let me just. They they are saying that they can't see what I showed just now. I couldn't either. Really? Yeah. That's really. Can you see it now? Uh. Uh. Huh. It's but I'll, I'll you know I'll share the deck and I'll add that slide. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll actually send you this um, code then because you were nodding yeah. along. I thought you were seeing it. Um, well, anyway, yeah, well, I'll send you this code. Yeah, I'm actually typing it in my own, so, yeah. Um, sh should I go on, or do, do we want to um, just uh, kind of no, hold no, it there on, and take on, questions? Um, go on, I just... Uh, it, yeah, but if people are exhausted, I don't want to kind of drag it out. Uh, well, I guess that's up to you. I have time. Are, uh, are people oh, good now they're seeing my desktop. Great. Ah, yes, there it is. There's that delay. It's, yeah. Well, no, I think that I had, somehow I had pinned your screen. Um, so, right. well, anyway, this is what it looked like. There was a static property consumed, and then there's a static method called is tipsy. And I'm setting the consumed inside the property, you know, inside the regular method drink, I'm setting that consumed and incrementing it all along. So when you call it like so, I make one glass and then another glass, and I keep drinking from them. Eventually, I feel tipsy. Now, obviously, the the downside of you know you have to think carefully about this stuff because obviously the key thing about this consumed is that if there were two of us drinking, we would have to think of a better way of doing this, right? We need to have a person object with consumed on it. Yes. Because <laughs> right now I've got two drink two glasses and I'm tipsy, but if two different people drank, then we'd be fine. Um, and right. if I drink, I'm tipsy after about an ounce and a half. So, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't drink, so I can't really tell you what mine is. Yeah. I, okay. I, I never drink more than one, just in case. Okay, so do, should, should we continue with inheritance? Yes. Okay, let's do that, and then and then we'll call it a day. So basically, inheritance sees all of the .NET library as a hierarchy of classes, and just like we have, you know, great grandparents and grandparents and parents and children, child classes inherit properties and methods and other members like events from their parents' classes. And just like real children, if the children don't like them, they can override them. So they get them by default, um, but they can create methods to hide their parents' methods. Um, so a little terminology here, the parent class is called the super class or the base class. The base class is the immediate parent. So it's not your grandparents, it's your parents. The child class is called the subclass. Okay. Now all .NET classes inherit from system.object and that's why when we created our wine class and had nothing in it, we had those four methods that come from system.object. Um, but in, um, in PowerShell 5, um, at least in the preview, you can base a scripted class on a .NET class just so that class is inheritable and the word is sealed when it's not. And um, Joel gave me a hint last night that this keyed collection .NET class is not sealed so you can base a scripted class like file collection that was his um, suggestion on this. You can also base a scripted class on another scripted class. And the syntax to do that is we have our, as usual, we have our class keyword and the class name and then a colon and the name of the class that we want to base the class on. So if I were going to create a wine glass that's based on a, ge a more general glass class, I would type class and then wine glass, a colon, glass, and then, um, Sorry, that doesn't go there. And then whatever I need for my class. So basically what I'm showing here, and I'm just going to switch over to here and show this to you, and I believe, and I do. Okay. So what I've created here is a wine class. Okay just like I had before. Okay. And now I've also created a glass class. And this is new. I didn't have this one originally. And I've created a size and a current amount and some constructors. And I have methods to fill the glass and drink from the glass. Okay. And now when I create my wine glass class, I base it on the glass class. So even though I did not define a size and current amount properties of the glass, my instances of the wine glass class will have them. Okay? And what I've added to this class, to the wine glass class, to distinguish it from the glass class, is a wine property that takes a wine object. Okay? And then I've created a constructor that takes the wine object and I'm using size and pour as just these are just parameter names right and I'm assigning pour to current amount and size to size and wine to wine so back up here in my glass class I have a drink method that takes any amount it doesn't return anything but it depletes the um, the current amount. And what I've done here is, is I've created a SIP class that calls the drink class and returns the current, it should call this drink class with one, and I apologize, and it returns the current amount. Okay, I'll save that. And I've created a little two string that overrides the toString in system.object and I will now correct 
the capitalization on that. So here I've created my wine so that I can put a wine in my wine glass and now I've created my wine glass. I can create other kind of glasses as well. But let's run this. There we go. And let's look at that wine glass. Woo, sorry. Okay. I'm going to send it to get member. So what we have here is kind of an inheritance mishmash, just like a real person. We have things like get hash code and get type from system.object. Okay. We have drink and fill from the glass class. And we have wine um, and sip that we defined in the current class. And we can use all of those. So I can call, so my wine glass dot drink, I can call this directly even though it's not defined in um, the, the child class, it's defined in the parent class. And then when I look at my wine glass, the current amount is depleted correctly. And I can also call sip, which is my local amount, which is my local property and it's decremented by one. Okay. So what I have in my class, in my wine glass class, is I have all of the goodies from system.object, all of the goodies from the glass class, and all of the goodies from the wine glass class. I think you see where this is going. We can also have a beer glass class. Okay, so here's my wine and my wine glass, and here's my glass class. <laughs> here's my wine glass class that comes from glass, and here's my beer glass. And what I've added to the beer glass is a gulp where I take, you know, just a big drink, I'm just calling this dot drink, and a spill which is uh, product probably more common to beer than it is to wine. And let's run this guy. Okay. And I've did I create a beer? Yeah, here we go. I've created a beer glass. Polygamy Porter is one of our local beers here in southern Utah. So my beer glass. And I could take a big gulp from it. Whoops, forgot those parentheses. Okay, and whoops, let's, ah, I cannot find an argument. So what's my, oh, what is my gulp? Oh, it already has three, that's why. Okay, so now I can look at my beer glass and it should have, yes, three less than the current amount. Okay, I think you have the idea here. Okay, and I'm just going to talk really briefly about um, uh, just a little terminology help here. When you have methods with the same name but a different signature, and by signature we mean the pattern of types in the parameters. Um, so you can have, you know, int, int, name, int, or sorry, int, int, string, int, wine, or something like that. If you have um, the uh, a two methods that have the same name, okay, but a different signature. So here this one takes an integer and this one does not, okay, then that's called an overload. Both of these are accessible in the um, local class and in the parent class. So if this one is defined in the parent class and this one is defined in the local class or vice versa, they're both accessible. Um, if this, Similarly, these can both be in the same class um, and, and we showed how to do that. You just create two methods with different parameters. And then, and this is called an overload, okay? Both are visible. And then override is when you have the same name and the same signature. And in this case, the most local one takes precedence. So if my glass class defines a drink method um, that takes an integer 
and my wine glass class defines a drink method that takes an integer. I will only in my within my wine glass class, I will only see this one. Okay. And I'm Joel, I'm going to skip interfaces, although I did the work for it, right? And um, get down to help. I just want to mention that um, because I think help is valuable for everything. Um, a couple of best practices um, for using help in classes. Um, make sure you have some examples. Show how to create an instance and use the constructors. Show how to use the properties and methods. Explain the purpose of the class and its instances. Describe the properties and their values. Explain the methods, the parameter values, and return values, and note things about inheritance and overrides and uh, even these interfaces that I didn't talk about. Okay. So classes really are the final frontier. When you look at MSDN now, if you weren't a programmer before, whoops, parts of MSDN that used to be just gobbledygook now make some sense to you, like the inheritance hierarchy, the list of constructors, and information here in the properties and methods about how they were inherited and whether they override. Here are just a couple of resources, the About Classes help file and the release notes. Um, the release notes have, um, have things in them that, that are not yet covered in About Classes. Um, there are a lot of great blog posts. Um, my entire talk was, um, was inspired by Trevor Sullivan's beer class in implementing a .NET class. Um, Lee Holmes did this fabulous thing with points. Um, that makes this beautiful animated diagram. Um, Thomas Lee has part one and two about writing classes. I did one where I um, started with a, a PS custom object and then created a .NET class to show you the advantage. And I did a little blog post about enumerated types. So he, these are all the people who helped with this. Um, again, it's a work in progress. Um, and we're using a preview. And here we go. Um, help yourself to a class of wine. Awesome. I don't think I have, um, you can hear me, right? I don't think yeah. I have any more questions um, so far. I'll, there was a, Kirk was muttering to himself about wondering how the performance of classes defined in PowerShell is versus classes defined in C Sharp. But um, I told him to go test it himself. Yeah, yeah, and I would actually be interested to hear. But I think at this point, you know, when you're doing something like this and you're scripting against objects that you create, I'm not sure that performance is really that much of an issue because you're doing things that you cannot do in any other way. Yeah, um, well, so, the, the, thing, yeah. the thing that gets me about, obvi obviously the key of making classes in PowerShell versus just... Because it's easy enough to call add type and paste some C-sharp in, right? Right. But the, but the key to doing it in PowerShell is that you have PowerShell syntax. And so well, well, the other thing is that um, unless you know C-sharp, that, that isn't available to you at all. Right. No, right. obviously. And, yeah, although, so, although, yeah it, I, th I think it, what this does is it takes classes and it makes them available to everybody, even if you yeah. don't program in C-sharp. Yeah, and it's it's still the case that um, currently there's going to be a lot more examples in C sharp. So um, one of the things that we've found, when, you know, like I told you when you were asking the other day about um, inheritance, I said my example was I was playing with Nancy, um, yes, and trying to trying to implement a, a web server <laughs> with Nancy, and I couldn't do it because there's a bug currently, but um, the thing about that is, yeah, all the examples are in C-sharp, so when I want to do it in PowerShell, for whatever reason, I'm converting from C-sharp to PowerShell, but the benefit for me is that I get um, access to PowerShell syntax and a whole ton of commandlets that are already written. Um, I, I've been giving people the, an example of... Uh, I'm, I'm looking for a new job right now, and... Uh, one of the places that I applied sent me a code test, and the code test was basically this JSON file that they want you to 
pull some information out of and present the top 20 things. Um, well, wow, that's I a wrote, line of code. That is one I line. literally wrote a one-liner in under like five minutes in PowerShell to do it and then spent 30 minutes rewriting it in C Sharp. Because in C Sharp, I had to do a lot more work. Um, I had to write a lot more code. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, but you know, some of the things that are done for you might not be things that you necessarily want done. So, you know, one of the oh, things absolutely. that got me was not not being able to hide variables. Yeah. No, there's there's certainly a lot of there's certainly going to remain reasons to do C sharp classes even when you're working primarily with PowerShell. And and one of the reasons of course is going to be down level compatibility. Um Right. Because this is a PowerShell 5 only feature, and if you want to make, if you want to do an inherited class right now, uh, it'll work in the February preview, but it won't won't work in Windows 10. So if you do it in C Sharp, then you uh, don't have to worry about what level of PowerShell they're using. As long as they've got add type, you're all set. Sadly, so there's, yes. There's both, but. Yeah, I'm excited about it because, like, even that, um, even that Nancy example that I gave, um, it once they fix the bug that prevents it from working, that will be a very cool um, way of with, like quickly putting up a UI kind of thing in an HTML server for PowerShell to just expose stuff. Um, that we just don't have a way of doing in PowerShell right now at all. So Yeah. yeah cool. You know, I, and I just want to mention um, on the interfaces, um, I managed with absolutely no background, I am not a developer, to implement the iComparable interface and um, and do a compare to method. I added it to my um, to my wine class and it this was really easy to do. So um, I'll give you the deck and you can go through it and, and just Yeah, do you have the, the source code files too? Yeah, I do. Do you have a link to those? Um I don't have them online, but I can okay. send them along to you with the deck. Alright, I'll put them up. I'm gonna um I'm gonna do our local user group has created a um I should I started I should I should clarify. The local developer user group, not the local PowerShell group, has created a GitHub repo where we put slides and demo code. So I'll I will do that for the virtual user group as well. Awesome. And so I'll post all this there and then tweet links to it later. Yeah. D does anybody else? Do we have any more questions? I'm sort of looking down the list. I don't see anything. Cool. There there was a there there's a link in the chat to a um, function versus class benchmark um, that somebody did. Yeah, but that, that was yeah, that was a um, a remark about performance. About uh, yeah. I think yeah, how, how to test the performance of these scripted classes versus .NET classes. Who is Nancy? Do you want to explain that, Joel? <laughs> Nancy FX. It go to nancyfx.org. It's the it's a uh, um, just a different way of doing websites in .NET, um, and 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 if you're writing in C Sharp, it's a really sort of simple, um, lightweight way of uh, doing routing and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Anyway. Well, I'm going to look forward to the virtual PowerShell user I, group presentation on Nancy. I told I told. Uh, I told Lee I had already picked out a name. I'm going to call it Power Mancy. Whoa! <laughs> like, woo! <laughs> anyway. All right. Thank you very, very much. This was awesome. I had a great time. Thank you. You can't hear the applause because it's virtual, but it's there. Yes. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.